Thank you, Heather. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, we're so pleased to host this webinar today, and we have great speakers for, lined up for you this afternoon. Karen McNeil, who is an associate professor in the Department of Marine, Earth, and Atmospheric Sciences from North Carolina State University, will first uh, start with her presentation. She will be followed by her department head, who is Walter Robinson, and he's going to speak a little bit about uh, the administrative point of view of, of, about this topic. And last but not least, Anthony Fake from, the, from Central Michigan University will be talking a little bit about his, his work and his experiences of being a geoscience education research faculty member. So with that, Karen, take it away. All right, great. Hello, everyone. Um, and thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, advance the slide. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a background and um, and talk a little bit about what what uh, geoscience education research is, and then tell you a little bit about my trajectory and how I became a geoscience education researcher. So first, I want to start with DBER, discipline-based education research. If you're not familiar with that term, and basically is it means the research and teaching and learning in all STEM fields, but it's not um, housed in a college of education usually. Um, and it's complemented by what we know about human learning and cognition, but it's grounded in the disciplines, priorities, worldviews, knowledge, and practices. And when we talk about DBER, we're usually talking about um, higher education, although there are DBER researchers that research K-12 settings, um, informal learning settings, and so forth. Go ahead. And so here are some of the, D, uh, the deeper fields and various STEM disciplines, physics ed, chem ed, engineering ed, biological education, math ed, and recently to the forefront, geoscience ed and astronomy ed. Um, and one of these reasons um, these fields have come to fruition is because it's been recognized that DBER brings, um, in part, uh, retaining more STEM majors and increasing our workforce demands, uh, which is one of uh, NSF's large priorities right now. Um, also, it, it needs to be recognized that a geoscience ed researcher, and really all the researchers, but specifically in geoscience ed, needs to have strong disciplinary knowledge. So when we're talking about these folks, they usually at least in our field, have a PhD within the traditional discipline um, in the geosciences. Go ahead. And so geoscience education research has been allowed for quite a while. And in fact, in uh, 1996, the National Science Foundation put out this report that basically said, hey, you know, we need to help cultivate um, discipline-based education research within the geosciences field. It's alive and well in chem ed, physics ed, and it should be alive and well in the geosciences. Um, so this is not a new idea, um, but it has re uh, gotten a lot of traction and has also really been budding um, in, uh, in a variety of uh, departments nationwide. Go ahead. And so some of you may be thinking, well, what's the difference between research and teaching or practice? And what do you mean by geoscience education research? And so, you know, we can look at teaching practice as practitioners that go out and do what they do. We can look at it as reflective practice, as practitioner who may go out and do what they do, but then they think about um, how the students responded to it, and they reflect about what worked and what didn't. Um, but they do this for themselves, and, um, and that doesn't necessarily turn into a publication. It's just um, really good pra uh, teaching practice. So when we think about peer review, we can think about two categories. We can think about the science of teaching and learning, um, which um, is grounded around a learning goal. But there is evidence of success that is um, shown within the students. And we can also think about formal research or geoscience education research. And this usually is rotated around a is hypothesis driven or uh, research question driven. And in both cases, you have data to support um, your claims. Um, and in both cases, you are sharing your results with others through peer review. Go ahead. 
And so what does this look like for our field? Um, well, our flagship journal, if you're not familiar with it, is the Journal of Geoscience Education. It has been around actually since the 1970s. It was called the Journal of Geological Education at the time. And then in the 90s, it changed its name to the Journal of Geoscience Education. And so we've been publishing in this area quite for quite some time. It's um, undergone a variety of transitions over time. Um, and now the journal publishes um, both SOTL as well as GER publications. And so when we talk about SOTL, the journal calls them curriculum and instruction papers. And again, these are rotated around course materials, teaching methods, but they, they have to have evidence of success. The other types of papers that are published include commentary, research, and review papers. Research papers um, are grounded in theory. Um, again, they're driven by a research question or hypothesis, and um, data is collected and interpretations are made. Go ahead. And so what does a GER faculty member look like? Well, should look a lot like some of your other faculty members in regard to teaching research and service. Um, you know, they're all important, just like they're all important for all of your other faculty members. And I'm not going to spend as, too much time on this slide because our other speakers are going to be speaking quite a lot about how benefits can gain from having a GER researcher um, on their staff. But a few things that I want to highlight, of course, is external funding opportunities. Um, GER research, researchers bring unique expertise that may help um, and increase your success rates um, or open opportunities for calls that you may not have had before within your department. They bring with them a research enterprise and therefore they will be bringing uh, and developing graduate students and undergraduates as well in this research enterprise so it expands another field of a uh, way of recruiting students to your potential graduate program. And they also can be leaders in effective teaching and learning within your department um, that can help uh, reform uh, teaching practices given the right environment, given there's a ready group of faculty who are interested and just need some tools and, um, and uh, other things that a GER researcher might be able to provide. Um, and I'll let the other speakers talk more about that as we continue on in this presentation. Go ahead. And so how can the field as a whole benefit from GER? Well, we want to know what works and what doesn't as it relates to learning. And you need evidence for that. And that's what GER researchers collect. Um, we, we could just keep teaching the way we've always taught. Uh, but we've been, uh, many universities are trying reformed and active-based learning because the evidence in K-12 has told us that this is, um, the best way to do it. Um, and so we need to con continue to collect evidence within the undergraduate setting, but also it's important to recognize um, that the geosciences are unique from the other deeper fields, and we have to conduct research that is appropriate for our context and our learning challenges. Um, we can't just depend on the other deeper fields to tell us how to do things. Um, and of course, GER researchers bring expertise. Um, we have a rich um, research backing, again, grounded in science ed, cognitive sciences, psychology, and so forth that um, include qualitative and quantitative research, um, foundational research, all the way into um, multiple institution uh, meta-analysis, and of course the classroom could maybe one of our field laboratories among others. And as a whole in the geosciences field, we, um, we are a socially relevant field. There's many global topics and challenges that require a literate society. Um, and, and this is one of the reasons why we, we should be doing this and doing it well. And of course, within our majors, we want to recruit and retain our majors, especially those from uh, diverse backgrounds. As many of us know, the geosciences is the least diverse STEM field. And we want to keep up with reform efforts and be ready to respond to national calls. And you can't do that if you don't have a ready group of researchers who are um, uh, knowledgeable and have the expertise to share. Go ahead. And so how did I become a geoscience ed researcher, or what I'm going to call a border crosser? 
Um, so briefly, uh, my background, I have a BS and MS in chemical oceanography and a PhD in geology. And during my PhD at Texas A&M, I uh, did 50% research um, on the topic of geoscience education and 50% research on the topic of biogeochemistry, all housed within the Department of Geology and Geophysics. That's what my degree says. So two papers in each of those topics. I went on to Mississippi State where I earned tenure um, continuing that um, model of 50-50 where I had a 50% um, geoscience education um, research pursuit and 50% biogeochem with a wet lab and so forth. And about three or four years ago I decided um, that you know I was getting millions of dollars of NSF grants in GeoEd and it was time to 100% dedicate my time to the, the field um, and my transition to NC State allowed me to do that. Go ahead. And my work here at NC State uh, focuses on how people think and learn about the geosciences and specifically that of global change education. And you're welcome to visit my webpage um, and learn a little bit more about what I do. Um, go ahead. Um, and I'm going to leave you with basically some of these references um, that might be useful for you as department heads and um, administrators um, maybe getting buy on from your faculty or higher admin. Some I referenced within the presentation already. Um, others just might be good resources for you to have on hand. And I think I'll leave it at that and let Walt go ahead. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for participating in this webinar. I'm Walt Robinson. Uh, I'm going to start, I, I would say before I even start, I'm going to say my perspective on all, all this as a department head, I've been department head for almost five years, is very pragmatic. So I'll start by giving a little context and then my view as a department head of what geoscience education research has brought to our department and what some of the challenges are. So that we're an R1 university. Uh, we're an all spheres department. There's a geology major, a meteorology major, and a marine science major, and active graduate programs and faculty research in all areas. Um, most of our, all but our faculty, all but one of our faculty are research active. They have graduate students and grants. We don't have a lot of non tenure track instructors. And we have two who are sort of a standout, <laughs> and you've just heard from one of them. We have two GER faculty. Um, to go back to the deeper context, discipline-based education research, my understanding of the history is it started in physics with Bob Beekner and the Scale-Up program. Uh, that was very successful. It led to a science, technology, engineering, and math STEM ed initiative uh, with money coming from the campus. And campus funds were provided for faculty hires uh, to a share between the department, the college, and the campus level, the provost office, in the STEM departments and campus. And we're the only department that got two such hires, and we got a second one, who you just heard from, from Karen, because our first one was very successful. Next. And there they are. <laughs> so uh, David McConnell, he joined the department actually just a year before I did. Um, a little admission there, when I interviewed and I heard David was going to be hired, I'm an atmospheric scientist and climate scientist, I thought, oh, that sounds nice, you know, but it's not what I do. <laughs> so I've, I've learned a lot since, since then. Uh, so he joined uh, the department as a full professor. He has over a million dollars in grants. Uh, I think the numbers are current, three graduate students and a postdoc. And he's very much a strong emphasis on classroom practice and efficacy, uh, effective domain, and metacognition of students. And then Karen, you just heard from, uh, she joined MEA as a tenure track associate professor a couple of years ago, three years ago now. Uh, she has good grants as well, three graduate students, I think that's right. And you've heard about the emphases of her work in geocognition. It's really exciting work in some new technologies like eye tracking and also a strong emphasis on climate and climate change literacy. Next. Okay, so what, what does a department get from a department head's perspective by having geoscience education research? Uh, one, one thing that's really been a lifesaver, I would say, for our department or some of our programs has been course reform. 
In particular, uh, David McConnell's group took over the introduction to physical geology. That's a gateway course to our geology major. They reformed the course in the labs. Uh, David and his students teach sections of that course very well. Uh, and they've implemented a distance version. There had been a distance version, but they completely redid that. Karen was instrumental in the reform of our Earth System Science course, which is an introductory course that's actually now required for all of our three geoscience majors as a first course. And something that's just going to happen starting this summer is one of David's postdocs is going to lead an effort uh, to reform our introduction to oceanography course. So we're kind of working our way through our curriculum, trying to reform our courses uh, and make them, make them better, but better uh, qualitatively better, not just quantitatively. Uh, the, the groups provide consulting in course reform. One of David's graduate students helped reform a course uh, on, uh, so it's really a paleo environment course focused on dinosaurs called the Dinosaurian World. These people are here, so we, we get lots of informal advice on teaching, on teaching resources. Um, we get seminar, great seminar speakers in, in uh, geoscience education. Uh, they provide, we have a peer evaluation of teaching, and it's really amusing for me as department head to see the peer evaluations of teaching provided by most of our faculty uh, compared to the ones that David and Karen do. Uh, there's a whole different level of analysis that you get out of your geoscience education research faculty. And I just listed, we've had a couple of, and then there's, there's an et cetera there that's important, but Kathy Manduka, Julie Labarkin, and others have come. Uh, one of the great things, this is out of David's group, are these geoscience videos for courses, and that's a YouTube channel that you can locate online. Last thing is training of graduate students, and this is not training just of their graduate students, which of course is good, but the training of graduate students across the across the department. Uh, standing up a brief uh, training course for all our teaching assistants that really gets them uh, really get, get hit the ground running in their first semester when they're TAs. We have a, uh, a climate literacy course that graduate students are taking in multiple programs, and then we have a GER graduate course in which most of the graduate students who take it are not GER graduate students, but graduate students uh, doing conventional geoscience research. And that sort of training has led to good success of our graduate students in getting faculty positions. Next. Okay, so what are the challenges? Because there certainly are some. Uh, some of the faculty just don't get it. And i that's an exact quote. Well, they're, they're just supposed to teach a bunch of intro sections, right? <laughs> and that's, there's a demographic thing there. Uh, that's more of our senior faculty. Um, and, and it's just a few, but it's an obstacle. It's a challenge. Some faculty feel threatened. They've been teaching the same way for years, and here's someone who's going to come into the department who's going to provide an analytical approach to what's happening in the classroom. And I think some people just feel threatened. You know, the classroom is their domain, and they want to maintain control. In general, our early career faculty do get it, and that's helped. We started sending, this is a new thing, our new faculty, incoming faculty, to the early career workshop that NAGT does. Uh, getting people to the Earth Educators Rendezvous, and, and we also have a, a, deeper, a, a little bit of a deeper focus in our on-campus new faculty orientation. And the faculty do acknowledge the benefits. Uh, one very clear case is our, fact, our geology major was in trouble, and one of the things that helped rescue it from being labeled underperforming and phased out was getting that gateway course, an attractive one, which started drawing uh, students into the major. Reality is most of our faculty are sort of like I was when I came from my interview, I want to do my climate science, right? Uh, but at the same time, most faculty, hopefully all, uh, want to teach better. And they'll show interest and support for geoscience education research if they see it's going to help them do the instruction part of their job better. At the same time, they probably want to put a box around how much effort they're willing to put into it. So they want the things that they can be told that they can make their courses better without a huge amount of work are where you'll get the most resonance. Next. Next slide, please. Oh, there we go. Uh, issues in promotion tenure. It's kind of early days. Uh, 
there are unique pressures on, there's this expectation, this gets back to, they're going to teach you this thing about teaching a lot of introductory session, sections. There are unique pressures that they're, they're here to serve the rest of the department, and those pressures are unique to the GER faculty. We don't expect a geochemist, let's say, to provide that service as much across the, the uh, department. Uh, there is this issue of limited venues for publication, and people say, well, if we the flagship journal, and uh, people who are publishing in AGU journals might say, well, is the Journal of Geoscience Education a first-class journal? And that can come up in promotion discussions. Uh, th this is a question I think I was asked to address. I would say there's very limited scope at a place like NC State to pay special criteria for promotion and tenure. We do have a statement of mutual expectations which guides the promotion and tenure process, but it's still going to look like uh, a GER faculty member's uh, statement of mutual expectations. It's going to have to look basically like everybody else's. Next. Okay, so I have two more slides. Uh, what should departments do? So my experience is uh, you get a stronger department if you have uh, GER faculty in your department. And, um, you know, research is, funds are tough to get. We have to, we can't, and in, even in R1, we can't just rest on our research laurels. We really have to provide quality instruction. And of course, we should be doing that anyway, <laughs> ethically. And they really, GER faculty really provide the engine of instructional reform from within. But that said, you can't just leave it to them and say, okay, we've hired these people, they're going to make our teaching better. It has to be part of a broad effort with broad buy-in uh, from across the faculty, and I would say reinforced by the department head, to enhance and reform instruction. Uh, I think the next one's the last. Okay, so I can, you know, uh, claim to be an expert here and give advice to everybody. Uh, the, we want to keep, maintain this effort to mainstream GER and that the opposite of the stove piping in it and setting it off at a corner. I think it's going to be effective and the faculty be successful in departments like mine to the extent that geoscience education research is thoroughly integrated. And, you know, the journal issue, maybe there should be an AGU journal. Uh, that would help provide another venue for publication and avoid the, the sequestering of the geoscience education work into one prominent journal. So we want to avoid stove piping, and I would say very specifically, uh, we have this Earth Educators Rendezvous. The second one is coming up this summer. It's a great meeting. One of the reasons it was a great meeting is because it was a thorough combination of geoscience education practitioners, people who are geochemists or climate scientists or whatever primarily, and the geoscience education research was there, and it flowed very smoothly from one to the other. If that meeting becomes strictly a geoscience education research meeting, then I think it's failed. I don't know if that's a risk, but I think it's one we just want to watch out for. And then some areas where we might be able to increase this mainstreaming and integration is focusing, starting to focus on graduate education and graduate student success. That's a valid area for research. Uh, focus on what happens, the how to get undergraduate research programs and undergraduate research experience, make them effective, assess their value. Uh, so that's another area that a lot of non-GER faculty are really committed to and interesting, interested in. And then we can even talk about education as it applies to our scientific communities. So maybe there's an area of research that's possible on making our research meetings, you know, AGU annual meeting, whatever. Uh, more effective. And with that, I'll close, and thanks for your attention. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Anthony, and uh, I'm a little different because unlike Karen, I am not a border crosser. I'm a master's level geologist, and my terminal degree is in education research. So, teaching improvement and teaching reform is a lot of what we do. But it's not everything we do, and I think that's part of one of the one of the issues we should address when when talking about uh, geoscience ed faculty. Some of the things we do are we analyze policy. Um, we do this stuff called other ways of knowing, which is you know beyond clinical or cognitive psychology style research. Uh, and also we need to define our own methods in our in our. Uh, 
practice. Um, I'm what you might call a second generation of geoscience ed person, um, and uh, I would say that, that Karen is probably also that, uh, by my guess. Um, a little bit about my institution, we just recently got uh, bumped up to R2. Uh, we have a medical school, and we have DBIR taking place in other STEM disciplines here. I am housed in a department of geography. That's my tenure home. We're a small department, although we have two science educators and two social studies educators, and that is because we are stakeholders and um, uh, we manage the certification training of science and social studies teachers. All right, let's do the next slide. Okay. Um, there are tremendous benefits to ge having a geoscience ed person in your department, but I want to present with you a few caveats. First of all, um, this issue of buy-in. So if the dean decides, hey, I really want a, a science educator in a geology department, um, the faculty need to be on board with that. And what they really need to do is understand the currency and the deliverables of geoscience ed research. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, if you want somebody whose main purpose is to establish a large federally funded research center, that's going to be a challenge because of the uh, nature and availability of uh, federal funds for this kind of, of research. Okay. Furthermore, if you want to hire somebody and your reasoning ends with the phrase, so we don't have to, whatever it is, these are not good reasons to go in this direction. So if you need intro classes taught, maybe you should work uh, on getting a contingent faculty person. An outreach person uh, should be an academic professional on a 12-year contract because you'll need that person in the summer. And that person could also be your liaison with the College of Ed. So the other thing is, and this is something that Walt had talked a lot about, and that is that um, that person needs to be a, a vital part of your department and needs to be part of your group, not it, it, we versus they, for example. Okay, next slide. Okay, and, and like we all said, there's a lot of benefit to having one of us on board, but the best way to go about determining that is to look at your mission. And I'm not talking about the, the bland mission statement. I mean your mission as in what do you actually do. Are you interested or do you have a stake in cross-disciplinary collaboration? Uh, we have a lot of expertise and experience doing that. Is your department a major player or a stakeholder in the education of public school science teachers? Do you want to address uh, methodically and analytically issues of recruitment and retention? I think everybody probably wants to do that. Do you want to address accessibility and diversity in the earth sciences? We are uniquely equipped to not only conduct scholarship, but also advocacy in that direction. Now, of course, everybody values uh, good teaching and learning. Nobody's going to say that they don't. But it's really about walking the walk in that respect. In other words, uh, um, is this something that you're actively looking to get involved in? And Success in teaching and learning, I would like to emphasize that, yes, that is boots on the ground teaching reform, but that itself is rooted in and, and driven by scholarship and research in teaching and learning in the geosciences. And because this kind of thing is site specific, there may be other aspects of your departmental mission, your technical core, what you do that a geoscience ed professional could help you with. Okay, next slide. So getting back to this issue of understanding our currency, okay, um, what is the new knowledge we make? And for example, if you hire a groundwater hydrologist, the new knowledge that person might produce, as an example, would be mapping a contamination plume, for example. Okay, that's new knowledge. That's familiar to most geoscientists. So what is it that we do? Well, we measure systematically, empirically, the impacts of classroom interventions. And by interventions, it's borrowed from medical research, which is we did something, what happened, uh, through a sound and empirically based process. <clears throat> Along that same line, we also do things like uh, that's called identifying barriers to learning. 
And that might be driven by a simple question. Why aren't students getting this? What do we need to know about what's happening in their heads to figure that out? Okay. But again, this business of teaching improvement. Um, uh, campus centers exist for this sort of thing. Uh, teaching improvement is a start, but it's not the everything. Now, because we are education researchers, because we deal with human problems and humans as part of what we study, and we are equipped to address the um, social interactions that take place related to our discipline. So some of us do work on things like inclusion and sexism and racism in the discipline. These are legitimate things that we study. We also study the impacts and the effects of law and policy. And a lot of it has to do with teacher training, but a lot of it also has to do with where society is going as uh, a result of law and policy. The other thing that we're equipped to do is that we can, we can turn geological events into teachable moments. So big geological event just happened or an environmental event just happened. What's the best way, what's the most systematic way What's the effective way, based on our research, to get this into the classroom and promote student learning? Um, people like at, UC, at NC State are doing things like modeling cognitive processes. In other words, like a psychologist would do, uh, what is the going on in the student's brain as she or he looks at a problem or tackles a geological activity? So because of all these things and because of our research on humans or you know, social actors, if I can interject some of my jargon here, is that we are in a position to uh, be advocates for things like inclusion, like uh, working against sexism and racism, for example. That's part of our training and that's part of, of what we are prepared to do in a, in a, in a department with our scholarship. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So before you hire, it's always good to understand the challenges and how you will respond to them. And of course, this is different depending on your situation at your institution. But you know, Walt talked about this. He said the faculty get, get a little uptight and say, and sometimes we might say, hey, we just discovered a, a great new way to teach this. And then the, somebody might say, oh, so what you're saying is that I've been doing it wrong. Well, we're not saying that. We're saying that here is new knowledge to be used. I mean, that's not the kind of thing one would ever say to, say, a structural geologist. But, but that's something that comes up. And the way that you can get out in front of that is to, is if make, to make sure that everybody, your, your faculty members, your administration, understand what we deliver. Um, we, and, which is what I talked about previously. Now, I'm going to speak out against very strongly this need for different or uh, what somebody might pejoratively say are dumbed down promotion and tenure standards. That is not the case. Uh, I was tenured by meeting my department's bylaws uh, and um, meeting the standards of productivity and service and teaching that everybody else had to do. It wasn't different for me. I wasn't assigned more teaching load. I wasn't, um, I didn't have different expectations. My institution, my university has specific requirements that apply to everybody. And the reason, part of the reason I was successful is because everybody evaluating my work understood what it was I was supposed to deliver in terms of scholarship of teaching and learning, in terms of uh, human and, and interactions with the teaching and learning environment. Okay, in other words, new knowledge is new knowledge. There isn't geological knowledge which is better than educational knowledge. When people are on board with that, then this notion of needing different standards uh, is mitigated. The other thing I want to talk about that you should be prepared for in the hiring and retention of geoscience ed faculty is this issue of isolation. Um, it is, no matter what you study, being a professor can be very isolating, but uh, GER people are often the only person in their department doing what they do. And so 
the isolation can be pretty profound, especially if you're in a climate where people don't understand what it is exactly you do. And so the way to address that, or at least try to mitigate that, is to, is to, un, is to think about in advance what are the opportunities for collaboration? What are the opportunities to integrate this person, person in our department culture? How do we do that? And do we want to do that? I mean, that's the first question you should ask. Is this something we want to do? And if the answer is no, then that's okay. You know that. All right, the next thing I said is that there's no NSF money for geoscience ed. What I really mean to say and should say is that there's just not much. Um, NSF is definitely a moving target in terms of what they have, what they're, what they're interested in funding, and that can change from year to year. And so when anybody, but in particular a GER person, at least in my experience, um, you can prepare to submit to something and then that program is closed permanently. And so you've got to then regroup and you've got to respond to a different RFP, which means you have to shift around your research agenda. But one thing to keep in mind, and I sort of alluded to this earlier, is that a geoscience ed person, yes, they go out and they get grants. Um, yes, they are competitive for those grants. But there are, likely, there ought to be, other aspects of your departments and institutional missions which they can serve in and uh, uh, be a part of and advance that should be just as important as the process of obtaining external funding. Okay, so this person has another function, has a, a variety of functions that she or he is especially well equipped and trained and credentialed to, to uh, make successful. I do want to address the issue of, of publication. Um, and what I have found and what I still think is true is that uh, so-called regular journals or journals that aren't educational journals, journals are interested in educational contributions. Um, I was one of the first or maybe the first person, I don't know, to submit a educational contribution to Geosphere and they were pretty happy to have it and they welcomed it. And so I think that you don't know until you ask in this situation, but I think the um, opportunities for that are there. Okay, this last thing I want to talk about uh, has to do with the fact that, well, first of all, sexism and racism is not unique to geoscience ed uh, hiring or workers or culture. Uh, we've all seen the headlines. Uh, every, every woman listening to this has experienced it. A lot of us have seen it, so it's not just unique to this situation, but, but the reality is this. Many traditional people tend to devalue or not understand what it is uh, education research is and what it does and what it's for. So it tends to be devalued, and, and there's often a uh, spoken or unspoken hierarchy where this research is better, this research is not all that valuable. Now, confounding that is the fact in educational fields there are a higher representation, there is a higher representation of minorities and of women than in many other uh, sub-disciplines of the science. And so it is likely or possible, I should say, that um, during the hiring process or during the career, the, the pre-tenure years of this person, that these issues may have a higher probability of percolating up. Um, it, it's a pervasive problem and um, won't go away on its own, but you, you're going to have to get in front of this in terms of setting, setting what you think the appropriate culture is in your department in terms of making sure that your hire, male or female, uh, minority or not, uh, is set up for success and, and uh, these systemic, these uh, um, discrimination issues are uh, under control or at least addressed. Okay, I think that's everything that I have to say. 
Great. Thank you so much for all of your presentations. Um, we will start the discussion portion of um, our webinar. And we do have a few questions come in from the audience. So let me have a look at these. Let's see. <clears throat> um, so first, can you provide some examples of how G GER is particularly unique or different from the other um, deeper fields like physics or bio? And how do these aspects um, inform or change your strategies for conducting education research? Who would like to take that one? Karen? Sure. Um, well, first off, um, and this is something that those that contributed to the Deber book that I referenced, the NRC Deber, is we have a field component, and not many other Deber fields have that. Um, and it was something that I know the the Kim Castens and Dave Monk work hard for to um, get into that NRC Deber book. That field um, activities and exercises was needed to show up and they got pushed back from the other deeper fields because that wasn't something that was analyzed as much in those fields. So I, I would say first off we have that. I don't know if anyone else wants to contribute but that certainly makes us unique. Great. I would add that there's a, a, a significant spatial cognition component to what we do too in terms of needing to visualize things in three dimensions and, and so forth. And so how do these things inform or change your strategies for conducting education research as opposed to just using the same, the same um, uh, outcomes and, and results from, say, ed or physics education research? Should I go on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, first of all, you know, we have to, a lot of field work has been done, a lot of work has been done on looking at folks in the field, and it's difficult. Um, it's difficult work. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we're following people around, uh, following students around field camps and how they're navigating the landscape. Um, people have tried eye tracking and videoing, um, you know, GPS tracking. Those are not things that will show up probably in a physics education um, type of paper that you would read. Um, you know, speaking to the spatial work, uh, we've worked a lot with cognitive, we being the collective we of GER researchers, worked a lot with learning scientists to help us um, come up with instruments that will um, identify spatial ability and skills um, so that we can uh, understand where some of the difficulties and novices are thinking um, in various spatial ways, um, penetrative thinking, rotational skills, and things like that. Um, and again, that may not be something that shows up in some of the other deeper fields because, like Tony correctly pointed out, um, the, um, the spatial need in our field. Great, thank you. Um... We have another question about how much um, how much do deeper faculty spend on collaborating with other geoscientists in terms of their broader impact statements and the outreach components of their NSF proposals? Any ongoing collaborations there? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, of course. Um, we had a question about how much do the um, geoscience education research faculty spend on collaborating with other geoscientists on their broader impact statements or on their mm -hmm. other NSF funded projects and their outreach components? Well, I guess to the extent that we're asked to, but yeah. um, it, it's, it's tempting to see us as, as someone I know put it, as broader impacts brokers. Um, the, that that statement is is sort of a dynamic thing, which which um, uh, is uh, is I think best written in partnership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, it's kind of like putting an assessment at the end of any project, and um, and then asking at the very end the the evaluator, well, what did you think? And the evaluator gives the opinion, but the project is over, and there's really nothing that could be done. And so by not by not integrating 
um, the broader impacts with the larger project, you not only run, you know, risk of, well, when NSF comes back and they want you to cut your money, the PI isn't really invested in the broader impacts field, so what do they cut first? The broader impacts. Um, uh, you know, but also if the project isn't invested in broader impacts and it's just sort of letting someone else do that for them, then it's not really helping, I, I would say, the field that all that much. It's, it's helping to maybe win that one proposal. Well, I, maybe I'll chime in this small. Um, so, as someone who does a lot of reviewing, and these are in uh, a lot of NSF proposals, mostly in, in atmospheric sciences, uh, most of the broader impacts components I see are basically crap. Thoroughly <laughs> <laughs> minimal and not well thought out. And this is going to be the funding climate for any kind of research is not going to get better anytime soon. So the, it's this is I think this is probably a place where department leadership has to be more active, and particularly with your incoming non-GER faculty and say, yeah, you've got to do it. You, you're going to have to build the partnerships with your GER faculty, but partnership is a key word. It's not something you can just farm out to someone else to do. So I think it's going to happen. It's going to be a Darwinian process that our incoming rising generation of faculty aren't going to survive unless they can produce persuasive broader impact components to their proposals, and that's going to demand they don't have the expertise, so that's going to demand that they collaborate on an equal level with the GER faculty. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, in regard to the current funding climate that you just cited, now, do you have any other funding sources outside of NSF that you think would be good venues for um, GER faculty to submit proposals? And I've largely gotten my funding from NSF. Uh, NOAA and NASA also have ed um, some educational enterprises. Um, the Department of Education, um, I know some people who have been successful there. Um, and then, of course, there's private foundations, but those are can be difficult to navigate. Um, they also don't like to pay for overhead. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. OK. So you're saying primarily government funding or federal funding? At this point in my career, at least, that's what I've been successful with. Um, mm -hmm. There may be people who do some things that maybe venture more into citizen science and things that might have more luck um, at, with other venues. Yeah, OK. Now, for Try your state funding, mm -hmm. too. Sorry, try your state yeah. funding. Oh, state funding. That's a good idea. Now, where, since you both have had um, graduate students under you, where do most of your um, uh, geoscience education research graduate students end up getting jobs? Uh, have you been seeing any trends with that? I'll go ahead, I guess. Um, from what I've seen, not just my students, but other GER researchers who have graduated, both PhD and both postdoctoral students, they are getting jobs mostly at uh, four-year um, uh, universities, some with graduate programs, some with not, um, in, a, in a wide range of, uh, across the country, really. Um, some get positions uh, in policy, um, you know, with the federal government and some nonprofit, but I would say majority go into four-year institutions. Anthony? I don't have a graduate program here. Okay, gotcha. Let's see. <clears throat> um, now, Karen, in your experience, uh, what is currently the hot topic for geoscience education research, and what impact does, do those questions and those outcomes have on our geoscience community as a whole? That's a tough one. Um, I mean, there's a lot of them. Um, I'm going to pick on one that I've just recently started, uh, for, and that's using augmented reality in the classroom and um, elsewhere. 
and I'm working with a team of folks who were all implementing the, if you've been, to, was at GSA last year, you might have seen the AR sandbox, um, and it can be implemented into introductory geology courses um, using, you know, teaching them topo maps and um, allowing real-time um, uh, interaction with the with the student who uses the sand to build mounts and you can see topo map changes real time and color changes and things so that's kind of something that's really really new um, and a group of us are implementing it um, uh, now actually um, so I'm going to speak to that because it's a little baby that I've been working on but there's a lot of other things we've talked about spatial thinking um, we've talked a lot about accessibility and diversity. Those are two very, very hot topics, work for, workforce development, but also not to forget about metacognition and affect um, barriers. Um, those, are, those are all recommendations that are actually of future research that are actually in the Deber book. And I want to point to a special issue of JGE that will be coming out, um, I think, uh, well, at least the topical papers are due in August, and it's supposed to be a review sort of, of where, we, where we've been with review papers and where we're going forward uh, as a field. And I think a lot of that question will be particularly interesting to look at um, within that special issue. Okay, great. Anthony, do you want to comment on that? Um, there's been a, an interest in uh, cognitive psychology, not as a topic, but more as a discipline. So um, there is there is a, um, a convergence being driven between the, the two disciplines mm -hmm. at present. Nice. Okay. Now, yeah, and I'll, I'm sorry. I'll just go ahead and, and add to that that you know we've got a number of us are implementing eye tracking. Re research into, um, which is a tool, but that can help us from the cognitive sciences, that can help us understand differences between experts and novices as they navigate uh, various um, pieces of information. Yeah, excellent. Fascinating. Um, so we have a question about dual department membership. So do you, do either of you have any information on how dual department department membership, say within a geoscience department and an education department, for example, um, how promotion and tenure work for those if you have a, a dual appointment? Well, usually in a dual appointment, you have a department that is the tenure home. Mm -hmm. And so you are, uh, primarily bound to the standards or bylaws, if they have them, of that home department, uh, while at the same time having a, 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 a performance towards the, those in the other department. But um, split appointments are really tricky because everybody has to be on board about the, the roles and the um, and the obligations of that person with the split appointment. Uh, also, a lot of times a person with a split appointment has automatically a doubled service load. And so the impact of that cannot really be understated. I'm going to echo that. Frankly, I would not touch a dual appointment with a 10-foot pole. Uh, particularly the type you just described. Uh, all the obstacles that were just mentioned, in addition to which, to be quite honest, uh, science colleges consider that there's elitism in the sciences. You'll be surprised. And <laughs> um, maybe not that much respect in a science college for your college of education. So I think a dual deployment would be, could take someone, a faculty member, very easily down a path of them being viewed as very different and probably not in a good way. Yeah, you might be setting them up for failure. Now, exactly. obtaining an affiliation uh, yeah. might be a good way to go. Affiliation is great because it helps you get serve on committees, uh, you know, graduate committees, and develop collaborative projects. But a dual appointment, I, I wouldn't go there. Interesting. OK. Um, one last question. As a GER faculty member, what advice would you give to those who have received pushback from their departments or from their colleagues about their work and research? Do you have any particularly successful strategies or how to mitigate some of those conversations? 
Anthony's well, written a paper, so go ahead. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, uh, this has been a lived experience for me. So uh, what I did was, um, you know, develop, uh, find allies, develop allies um, among the senior faculty and in your dean's office who can be, whose minds are open to and who are interested in uh, your your currency and your deliverables. Um, and present that research at brown bags, at uh, um, seminars, and early on, very early on, like within your first semester, um, have friendly conversations with everybody before you even know their position on you uh, with uh, what you do and things. May, maybe you can talk collaborations, but you do have to read the situation and see if and just, you know, maybe find something that simply interests them. You know, it's like, oh, that's an interesting problem. You know, I, they may have no interest in, in a form of collaboration, but but mm -hmm. um, they might. If you can put them in a position where they can geek out on your research a little bit, uh, that kind of um, community building is really your way to go.